on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. My father informs that the big question in my writing a lot, my father doesn't believe in God, um, so there are times when I wonder uh, what he thinks about when he thinks of death, what he worries about, what because he's unable to articulate them really through his because because of his strokes. So he he sort of sometimes at night in his own mind and what happens in those cases and where where does your mind take you when you don't believe in God? Um, and I I've become comfortable with not knowing the answer to the question, but I wonder if I will want to know more, or if I will desire that answer more uh, the older I get. Michael Graff is a freelance writer and editor. His work has appeared in The Guardian, Garden and Gun, Politica, Success, Our State, Southwest the Magazine, and SB Nation Long Form. He writes a monthly column for the back page of Charlotte Magazine, where he served as editor from 2013 to 2017. Previously, Michael served as a senior editor and writer at Our State Magazine, and as the Sunday Enterprise writer and a sports writer at the Fayetteville Observer. He has received multiple notable selections in Best American Sports Writing and Best American Essays. In this episode, we explore freelance writing, storytelling, life, death, success, and love. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Michael, what do you do? <laughs> Well, I'm a writer and an editor, and uh, formerly the editor of Charlotte Magazine. I was that for five years. That's, uh, I guess, a bio line. But I've had friends who um, who say that one of the proudest moments of their life is when they get to tell somebody uh, that they are a writer. When somebody asks them, what do you do? And you say, I'm a writer. And I haven't exactly had that moment um, yet where I think I'm doing this one thing because I think writing is so much more than that. Writing involves, uh, writing is really a form of learning and you're just, you're going around and you're meeting people and telling stories about their lives. So I do consider myself a storyteller in various forms, um, whether it's profiles or essays or narratives about crimes or or policy stories or things like that. I'm just a storyteller trying to tell stories about other people. What are examples of stories that you tell? Well, I have, um, I would say I've written a lot of different stories. Um, and since I started this career, I guess with my high school newspaper in 1994 or whatever, but uh, my first story that I ever got paid for as a salaried employee was a story about a high school softball coach getting hired or high school baseball coach getting hired. Um, I still remember his last name was Younce and the it's, it's evolved, uh, to the point where my most, most recent story was a story in uh, the guardian about what happens to a rural community when it loses its hospital and how does that affect them? Not just from a healthcare standpoint, but from a community standpoint, and you end up finding out things like it's like when there's a quote in the story where it's it's like what happened what would happen if Green Bay lost the Packers. This used to be this thing that we would 
we knew it was there and it was a community center. So I, the stories in between, I've written about everything from uh, suicide of a basketball player to essays. The most profound essay probably still is an essay I wrote about my father in 2014 for Washingtonian Magazine, which really was my first time dealing with his uh, strokes that he's had and trying to figure them out. And the story is basically, my dad was a skydiver in the 1960s. He jumped 1,400 times out of planes, um, and he could land on something the size of a nickel, jumping from 12,000 feet. But he never told me and my brother about it, never talked about it, never told stories about it until after he had his strokes when it became, when he sort of started to have those memories come back stronger and more vivid than the memories that he was making that morning. So that essay uh, really has, has has been something that I go back to from time to time and just um, to just try to understand where I am. But the other stories, like I said, there's policy stories, there's political stories. I just wrote a story uh, last winter. I wrote a story um, Charlotte, Charlotte folks will be interested in on how sort of team of Hugh McCall and Braxton Winston formed. You had this 82-year-old former banker and head CEO and this 34-year-old protester and how they had come together to form a team that talked about issues in Charlotte. So you, there's, I don't know, there are tons of different stories out there. I've written about, I have a particular interest in skydivers. Uh, I've written up, up about a few of them. One woman named Cheryl Stearns who had 20,000 skydives who lives over here by the airport. Um, I don't know. There's just, there's a lot of them. Is there a type of story you'd like to tell? You know, I, they say, I, how should I put this? I had, for a long time in my career, I would hear from editors that, and other fellow writers that were all, all writers are essentially writing one story just through different subjects. And I didn't know that that was true. I didn't think, I, I just thought I was taking things that interested me and uh, chasing them. One friend told me one time that I write stories about people who were able to be great at one thing early in life and then couldn't do it anymore. And she saw that as a natural arc to all of my stories. And she's a great writer, so I believed her. But lately, I think I'm trying to find the theme underneath of most of, of my writing. And I think most of it comes back to this, this question that I have. There's a question that drives most of my writing, and, I, and the question is, what are we doing with this life that we've been given? And that question is informed by questions that I have about the future beyond this life, things beyond this life. I wasn't raised in a family um, that went to church. Uh, I was raised by parents who told me that I was allowed to figure out my own ideas of, of faith and where we were going after this. And so I still have questions about what happens after this life. And I'm really interested in how people are spending their time here. Whether you think you have an eternal place in heaven or whether you think that life ends um, at your last breath, I think we all want to figure out how we are. We all need to be cognizant of how we're spending our time here and, and what we're leaving behind when we when we depart this question of what to do with this life and what comes next how does it show up in the stories that you tell i think it shows up in really subtle ways in the story that i mentioned earlier about hugh mccall and braxton winston it's an unlikely pairing and that that sort of made it interesting to the editors when I pitched it an 82 year old uh, white former banker and a 34 year old black protester and how that relationship was formed. But one of the things that one of the questions that underlines that is Hugh McCall is, is 82 years old and knows that he doesn't have 50 more years left on this earth. So he's trying to figure out how is he going to spend his last decade or two. And he's constantly learning. Hugh McCall is constantly trying to, he grew up 
in a racist town in southern in South Carolina, and now here he is. He's 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 constantly trying to understand the world better and trying to understand where it's going and trying to contribute to that that progress. Uh, so that. It may not have been in the headline of that story, but it certainly comes through underneath the, the surface. You know, we've been, and, and for Charlotte Magazine, when I write for Charlotte Magazine now, there's, we've been lucky enough to be here <laughs> at this point in Charlotte's history when we have this amazing growth happening. And so what are we all doing with it? I think that question comes through in all, most of my stories for Charlotte Magazine. What are we doing with our time in the city? Are we learning from the mistakes that we've made in the past and preventing them from the future? Or are we, what kind of role are we all playing here um, now? Are we just consuming the city or are we contributing to it? I think that question shines through. Michael, do you think of your writing as an exploration of, of death? I think, you know, death is, if you're a narrative storyteller, death is the end of a story, right? So that that you are writing about, um, you should be writing about life and death a lot because it's the central theme in all of our lives. But, you know, um, a few years ago after the Washingtonian story on my father was published, uh, a few editors and um, agents reached out to me and we talked about possibly writing a book. And the consensus was from them that, that it wouldn't be a book and this is a book about my father, that it wouldn't be a book until after his passing. And it sort of left, I was, it, it angered me so much at the time um, that I, I haven't gone back to the proposal. I don't, I don't think, I try not to think about it because I want to live my life with my father. And I don't want to be thinking about that there's some project on the end of his um, passing. But but I do, I write about him a lot because he has been on a decline for seven years now, eight years now. And he, there are scenes that you see in everyday life that you, that you wouldn't understand if you were just an able-bodied person living an able-bodied life. Um, when we go to restaurants with him, he's in a wheelchair and Sometimes they live near the coast and we will wheel them up on this patio and on a patio that overlooks the water and you immediately realize that all of the railings, for some reason, are right at his eye level. This happens everywhere. He can't have a moment of peace just looking out on the water and he was a fisherman. He would love to do that. Um, we, you know, I, I, I think my father... Um, my father informs that the big question in my writing a lot. My father doesn't believe in God. Um, so there are times when I wonder uh, what he thinks about when he thinks of death, what he worries about, what, because he's unable to articulate them really through his, because, because of his strokes. So he, he sort of sometimes at night in his own mind and what happens in those cases and where, where does your mind take you when you don't believe in God? Um, and I, you know, I've become comfortable with not knowing the answer to the question, but I wonder if I will want to know more or if I will desire that answer more uh, the older I get. Um, you know, as a kid, my father's mother was Catholic. My mom's mother, my mom's grandfather was in a, uh, was a minister. It was in their background. There were times when I was certain that there was life beyond this life. And then there were times when I would read, you know, these, I would, I, as a, as an adult, you grow up and you, you start to under, understand the universe a little more and you start from a scientific perspective and you think, no, there's no way. And then, and then you just sort of think, maybe it's okay to believe in something, you know, and I don't know what that, and some people, maybe it's okay to believe, believe that you see God in interactions with other people or things like that, you know, just little, little 
pleasures of earth. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, so is writing an exploration of that? Yeah, because that's sort of the exploration that I'm on right now. Um, and especially with my father, one of the reasons I went freelance writing, went to, as to freelance writing full time was that I'm able to spend more time with him. I can work from their, their home is about four hours from here in Charlotte and I can go work from there and spend time with him and help him, um, and help my mother. Um, I wish I could do more. Um, but you watch how he, I watch how he goes about his daily life and I watch how he thinks and I watch the things that he worries about compared to what other people worry about are just, they're so different. He would love, <laughs> it's funny that you asked this question today. I was just there on, uh, I was just visiting my parents on uh, Saturday. It was at the end of a beach trip with my, with Laura and um, my parents live not far from the beach where Laura's family vacations. And so I went back and forth a few times during the week and spent time with my parents and spent time on the beach. But the last day I, I had lunch with my parents and, you know, at the end of a vacation, you start to think about all the things that you have to do. And I rattled off this list and I don't know why I did it. I don't know. I rattled off this, this list of stuff that I had to do and I had to get back and, I got this story and this story and I'm um, going on an assignment out of town tomorrow and I just I have to get it all done. I have to get it all done. And my dad, who doesn't say a lot, just out of nowhere said, yeah, but you could be in this wheelchair. And that was sort of it. That was all he said. And the next thing he wanted was... <laughs> was for the waitress to bring him french fries i mean there's there's where his thoughts go but some every now and again he just he pipes in with this thing that reminds me that that he's still my dad <laughs> The answer to the question of what to do with this life and what comes next is elusive. <laughs> is there a glimmer of an answer for you? <laughs> I, my answer, uh, my former boss, Rick Thurm is going to laugh at this answer because Rick hired me. Uh, he was the publisher of Charlotte magazine and he hired me and he brought me to Charlotte and he sends me a note every time he reads my column now because he says, I'll be damned if you didn't find a way to get your wife into that column again. And so I think my, but to answer this question, I have to bring up Laura. To know what my answer is to that question it changed dramatically uh, when I met Laura and it changes every day that I'm with her. The answer to what am I doing with this life um, really is a daily answer to what am I doing? What am I, what am I contributing to this marriage and how, how are we living together? And what are we, what are we going to create to make out of the day or out of the hour to make this world a better place in the future? And, um, whether it's just relaxing on the beach to, to sort of stay sane or whether it's actively going out and participating in organizations in Charlotte or things like that whether it's making a good meal that we will remember uh, for years to come or whether it's making sure that we're out for a good meal or something. It's, it's that the answer to my question is, is probably has a lot to do with love, I guess. Um, and in its most basic form, um, how, how am I loving? Who am I loving? And what am I doing with that love? I guess those, those things drive me every day. Michael, I'd like to turn back to storytelling. Yeah. Take me through how you go about your work when you have an idea for a story. Yeah. There's a there's an answer that I can give that, that a lot of freelance journalists would probably want. I'm a freelance writer now. I I think a lot of times uh, freelance writers want to know how do you do it? You know, what do you what are the step by step processes that you use? 
I don't know if I would go step by step, but to say that there's, I have a list of ideas, a running list of ideas that I will never be able to, to work through. And they come from everywhere. I have a friend who just got a book deal and he said that he got the deal because he read the last sentence of an exhibit at the museum, on a plaque at an exhibit at a museum. And I think a lot of times writers understand that. Writers know that everything that we read is brings about the possibility that there's another story out there. This morning I read, was reading the Baltimore Sun on my iPad and came across a story about this bandit dine and dasher in Baltimore who's going around to all of these restaurants and leaving uh, without paying the bill, including <clears throat> at the Sagamore Pendry, which is owned by Under Armour owner Kevin Plank, and where he left a $267 to $7 tab the other day. And and he document the funny thing about him is he sort of documents it on Travelocity. So he has all these fans who are following him around at all these restaurants, but the police can't catch him. And his most recent one was he was in Budapest. or He said he, he, said he traveled to Budapest and did it there. And so he's sort of this interesting, I, I don't know why he's spending his time on earth doing that, but it, I, there's something in me right now that aches to find out everything about that person. So I put it on the list of things that I may want to do one day. So that's where ideas come from. They just come from reading. And then as a freelance writer, you really, you, you sit back and you think about what, which stories you really want to try to um, go after because the types of stories that I tell the longer stories some of them can take uh, multiple weeks or multiple months and and in many cases you're living with uh, the subjects and when some if you're writing about somebody in a story who gets married or dies or something like that if you're really if you if you're doing your job as a writer you're 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 almost crying at those moments when you have to write those sentences. So these, these are very emotional journeys that I, that I'm writing. And, uh, so you kind of have to figure out your, as a freelance writer, your flow, for instance, after writing the hospital story, uh, I, on healthcare, I don't think I will be going. I think I would, you know, I'm, I'm moving towards something that might be a little lighter just to sort of provide that balance in my, in my brain as I, as I go about a year of telling stories. Michael, when you're gathering information for a story, what are you looking for that tells you that you have this story? Um, the answer to that is elusive because a lot of you tell s- stories and a lot of times when you're telling a narrative, you're telling a narrative about somebody's life, whether it's your own or whether it's an institution's life or whether it's another person's life and you're leaving it. So the story is never really complete when you're done uh, in a lot of ways that that person's story will continue. So to me, I, I don't think there's ever a moment when you feel like you're done reporting. I know that I leave far more stuff in my notes than I publish exponentially more um, stuff in my notes than I ever publish. And so to me that, that is the reporting process. And I I would say this to anybody who's writing the report to me, the the reporting process is far more interesting than writing because the reporting process is just learning and finding things that make your brain fire and finding quotes that may, maybe you haven't heard before where somebody says something about something that you've never heard said in such a way or digging through archives and finding out, wait a minute, we had this same situation arise 50 years ago. And there's a, there's a moment of um, surprise there in the reporting. So Sometimes reporting can be traveling and you're just off and doing something that you never would have done. So to me, the reporting process is far more interesting than the writing process. The writing process is brutal. It involves staying in one room and being surrounded by coffee cups and water cups. And and when it's going really bad, sometimes a glass of bourbon, you know. Uh, so... The reporting process is the fun part, the process that I try to drag on as long as possible before I actually start writing. So I don't think there's a moment when you know you have it all, but you just kind of have to stop at some point and write. Michael, you were a writer who became an editor, an editor who is now a full-time writer. 
how does one inform the other in your work? It's a constant struggle. Um, E.B. White is somebody that I admire deeply. He's probably, I, I have every, everything he's written on my shelf at home, including a book he wrote, he wrote, uh, he edited of essays from his wife, Catherine, and she was a gardening columnist and she was, but she was an editor first. In, in that book, he describes how writing was a painful process for her because she was an editor first and she would edit every paragraph. She would never sort of let herself loose. And I certainly I found that to be true as um, somebody who, you know, has edited for a living and sometimes seven or eight long stories a month. You're, tr- you're constantly trying to make sure that you're writing. I, I can spend hours on the first paragraph and not, never let myself loose from it, whereas other writers can just free write. And the old adage that they, you just write the first write the first draft with your heart and then uh, revise with your brain. I tend to write a paragraph with my heart and then my brain gets in the way again. So um, it's <laughs> it's a it's a process and it's not as enjoyable for me as it is for other writers. Like I said, the reporting to me, the adventures, the, the learning is more interesting to me than the writing. Having been an editor. Mm hmm. How do you react when your work is edited? Oh, it's definitely made me a better friend to editors as, as a writer. I have, I used to, I wrote a note to myself one time after I got a nasty note from a writer when I was editing and I simultaneously had a story going through the edit process and it's sort of the mantra that I live by. It's like writers be good to your editors, editors be good to your writers. And to me, that means if you're an editor, get back to somebody on time uh, with edits. Don't wait five months to respond to somebody who's hanging on every word that you or hanging on every edit that you've got. And if you're a writer, turn stuff in on time, um, turn it in clean, be responsive to edits. Yeah. I'd be I'd be lying if I didn't say I know a good editor when I see her or him because I do. I I, I know that some editors are better than others and. I had a great editor one time who uh, changed my life with editing, actually. Um, she was a, She's the features writer at the Washingtonian Magazine. And she called me after she got my draft and interviewed me about how I did the story. Rather than just send me notes back, rather than just a lot of editors sometimes will send notes back to say, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to. She called me to interview me to understand why I made all the decisions I made before sending me the draft back. And I've done that. I think, you know, a lot of Charlotte magazine writers will, will attest to that, that I ask more questions in editing than I do give direction. I, I, I really want the writer to come up with the conclusion. Why did you do this? Where were you going with this? Is there anything more here that we can do? Uh, not you need to dive here harder and stuff like that. So. Michael, why do you tell stories? <laughs> I, that's that's an interesting question. We all are storytellers in some ways, right? We all, it's sort of the foundation of our society. The most well-read book of all time is a story, you know, the Bible. Like, this is not, this isn't new. We all, we all grew up with a grandfather who was good at it or an uncle who was good at it or a mother or a father or somebody in the family who was able to, to do that better than others. I, me, I had a, I had a great uncle who raised my father because my father, father didn't feel the need to raise him. And my great uncle was second generation Irish and told a lot of stories and he told a lot of jokes and, and he, was able to incorporate the humor in the middle of a serious story. And, and I just loved how was he was able to do that. And I try to do that in my writing. I try to find, I try to find even little moments of humor in a very difficult story. I try to like let people breathe a little bit. Do you write for yourself or do you write for an audience? I would like to say that I am writing just for an audience. And as an editor of a magazine, if I had a boss, I would tell him that I'm writing for an audience or I'd tell her that I'm writing for an audience because audience is most important to, to brands. Um, but as a writer, no, uh, there's a 
I'm trying to answer that question. I'm still trying to understand there, there's a selfish component to writing. I would say that it, that my answer to that question can change within a few minutes of a story being published. There are moments when I'm writing a story where I don't think I'm any good at writing at all. And you overcome something when you're writing and you, you make it through the story and you feel like you've turned in something that's good. And so that is, that is a, that is a moment when you, as a writer, feel like you've accomplished something. But I would also not be telling the truth if I didn't immediately wonder what people thought of a story when it goes out into the world. And there are times when I will see that somebody has sent me a note on a story. And let's say it's a politician from New Hampshire or something like that. And then somebody else is an activist from Arizona or something like that. I'll, I'll read, I'll try to figure out what they saw in my story. Why did that story connect with that person? Where were they in their story that they were able to appreciate the story that I just published? And because people are reading stories through different lenses, you have to, one thing I always, I used as a, an editor, I would tell writers is once you're done with, once you, you've done all this work on this story, but please know that when you publish it, it's not yours anymore. It's always the reader's and the reader comes at it from his or her perspective. The reader has had an entirely different life up to that point than you had. So you, you narrated a story just now and that reader may not appreciate the way you did that or the reader may love it. It may fit with that person at that moment. I think that's always an interesting point. There was a, a, a writer uh, out of Wilmington named Philip Gerard who told me one time I was editing his work and he had gone out to a story subject and uh, to a story assignment and the story subject was just having a terrible day. And the story subject was really mean to him. Didn't want to answer the questions. Didn't want to participate in Philip's story. And Philip is an accomplished writer, and I, 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 as an editor, was apologized profusely. I said, I am so sorry that I sent you out to an assignment that you had to deal with a jackass. And he said something I'll never forget. He says, no, that's okay. I, I don't know where he was in his story that day. I don't know what what he was going through. And so Philip didn't feel bad about it, or Philip wasn't upset by it, but I was. And that stuck with me, I think. And so... You take that approach to everything or every interaction you have. You don't know what somebody's gone through in that moment. Michael, there are quotes on the homepage of your website by other writers describing your work. I'd like to get your thoughts as to why you chose these quotes. Okay. First, graph opens my eyes to things I haven't seen. Travis Dove said that. And Travis Dove is... Um, a photographer who's uh, I used to work on stories with uh, at our state magazine. We traveled around the state and worked on most of our stories together. And he has uh, taken pictures for everybody from the New York Times to National Geographic. He's a fantastic photographer. So for a photographer who goes through the world with a camera up, taking pictures for him to say that I opened his eyes to anything uh, meant a lot to me. And that's why I chose that one. That That's something that I, th I hope my writing does for people. I don't think it's vanity to say that. I think it's, otherwise, why would I be a writer? Why would I, why would I, if I didn't think I had the ability to try to show people this world in a, a way that um, maybe doesn't conform to the way that they thought before they were reading the story. I don't really know that I should be a writer. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's what writers should do. Show the world to somebody in a way that is different. Graf's curiosity and persistence in reporting injects his stories full of meaning. I think that to me is a personality thing. I like to have fun. I like to laugh. One of, one of my vows with my wife in our wedding was that I promised to make her laugh every day. And we, we have that as a foundation of our relationship. But as much fun as I like to have and as much as I like to laugh, I like to find meaning. And I like to, and especially in my stories, I'm, 
I'm just a person who's always thinking about the larger meaning of something. And I, th- I think people should know who they're, if, if an editor was to read, were to read my website, I think that editor should know who I am. I think that's part of it. Graf is a blue highways kind of guy. <laughs> he doesn't forget the back roads. No, I prefer them actually. That's, um, that was Leanne Henyon, who is, uh, she's a, a writer out of, of Boone and she's, she's sort of the same way, but I do prefer the back roads. I, I a lot of it is, uh, <laughs> I like photography a lot. I'm not an expert on it. I don't know how to do it, but I like, I understand what, where good photographers stand for good pictures. I was at a conference one time and I, I, there was a great sports photographer there who took a photo of golfer at the end of a round and there's a wall of photographers in front of the golfer. <laughs> but this photographer was behind the golfer. And I always wanted to be the person who was not in the same spot as the other reporters. And I learned, I guess I learned a lot of that as a sports writer. I started my career as a sports writer. I never wanted to be in the scrum. I never wanted to be the guy who was one of the hand. You can't see my hand going up, but it did. A guy who had his recorder up in somebody's face. I wanted to be the guy who was sitting next to somebody having a private conversation, trying to understand what happened in the game. So I I guess that is, that's the back roads mentality, I guess. Long piece, daily piece, whatever he's doing, Mike always wants to make it great. He elevates those around him. Yeah, I am not. Um, <laughs> that, I guess, comes through in my, as an editor, for sure. I try to, I'm fairly intense about this this thing that we do. I, I'm, I believe in this industry. I believe in storytelling. I believe in journalism. And I study it all the time. And so when I have conversations about it with fellow writers and storytellers, I think that just shines through. And I think and I hope in some ways that it maybe rubs off on people. And um, it was what I did at Charlotte Magazine. I mean, one of the greatest experiences of my life was being the editor of that magazine because we were to me, it was just about building a team and building a vision and trying to get bunch of people to believe in the idea that the stories we tell matter and that we can tell meaningful stories long short mid mid range whatever that help people understand what the city's like today what charlotte where charlotte's been and where it's going and to try to get them to buy into that and so the only way i know how to do it was to was to participate in it was to write myself to sort of show them i I'm passionate about it and to let that passion rub off on people. Michael, you recently wrote a back page column in Charlotte magazine Mm -hmm. entitled, how do you define success? (laughs) Is success on your mind? Yes. Uh, but the idea of success has changed uh, dramatically. I was eight years old when I decided to be a journalist. My father was a fisherman, a charter fisherman. My mother was a school teacher my favorite thing to do in the world was go to see the Baltimore Orioles play baseball. And we were only able to do it once or twice a year because we didn't, you know, we weren't poor, but we didn't have a, you know, we didn't have a ton of expendable income to go to baseball games. So I was reading the Washington post one day and I found out that there were people who got to go to these games for free and they were sports writers. And that was when I decided to be a journalist. You know, I worked, every day after that to try to be that. And then I became a sports writer and I was covering some of the bigger events, Duke and Carolina basketball and things like that. And then I decided, you know, maybe I didn't want to work every Friday and Saturday night, um, to covering sports. Maybe, maybe there's another way to do this. And then I started to do the longer form storytelling and I was moved over to the Sunday enterprise team at the Fayetteville observer and I was writing stories during the war about the effects of um, the Iraq war on soldiers and really telling human stories about that and and just sort of fell in love with with the longer form storytelling, trying to find meaning. And I used and when I got involved in that, you started to have these these other dreams like maybe I want to win a Pulitzer one day or maybe it's a prize. Maybe it's a magazine. Maybe it's I want to work for Esquire one day. You know, I want to have the cover story of GQ or I want to do this. 
And I was having lunch with a friend uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went back home to Maryland to tell us to write a story for Garden and Gun magazine. We had this conversation, and I, he he was a former journalist, and he now uh, is out of the industry and doing something else. And we were talking about what success looks like, and I just I said. I don't care about those things anymore. And because he was a former journalist, he sort of astutely asked, so what do you care about? And I said, I just want to be able to do this for a living. I want to be able to continue to do this. Um, I want to continue to tell stories for the rest of my career. That's what I want to do. I don't want to, I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be prized. I just want to be able to make a living doing this thing that, that fuels me and, and feeds me. You are living your life on your own terms as a published writer. Mm -hmm. You're married. You have your own home. You have close friends and family. You're respected by your colleagues. Do you feel successful? Um, yeah, some days I do. Some days I, you know... When you're a freelancer, sometimes your, you know, your idea of success is you have to wake up that day and ask somebody why they didn't send you your check yet. You know, there, there are, and so getting response like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll get that out today. That makes that a successful day. Um, so some days, yeah, I feel very successful. Other days, you know, some months are, as a freelance writer, some months I think I'm going to be rich with money. Um, I'm already rich in lots of ways, but I'm going to be, I'm going to have lots of money. And then there are other months that are pretty dry. So it, it comes and goes. And I think real success will be staying even, um, through the good times and, and the bad times. And I, I, I feel like I'm closer to that. I, 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 I used to never sleep on Sunday nights. I used to wake up in the middle of the night, worried about all the things that were going to happen in the week. I, those are fewer and farther between now. I'm not really sure. Am I successful? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think in some ways I am, and in some areas I am. But we still, we still all have a lot of learning to do. I think <laughs> that's a lifelong goal, I guess. Michael, you wrote, maybe success isn't measured in achievements mm -hmm. or being happy with who you are. Maybe success is having the wherewithal to be grateful. Yeah. At the precise moment, you have something to be grateful for. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I, I think appreciating where you are in life and, uh, not being so focused on what you need to do or haven't done or anything like that is, is sort of a key to, to being successful. Um, the, the lead up to that story is in that in that column was that we had I I was a part of a great team of sports writers in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina in the mid two thousands, and we all couldn't wait to get out of there. We had wonderful times though. We played wiffle ball in the parking lot every single night at like three a.m. during the summer. We were editing each other and making each other better. And everybody moved on from there and became very successful um, in terms of their career. They moved on to bigger places and things like that. And we all look back on it and say, you know, I wish I didn't spend so much time worried about trying to get to the next place when I was there. I wish I wish I had just taken a few moments or a few days when I was there to say, this is pretty good too. And this is this is this is something I should be thankful for. And it's a hard equation to to solve, I think, because you have to, <laughs> it's recognizing, recognizing the exact moment when you should be comfortable <laughs> because things are always going to get better. Or they're going to get worse and they're going to get better and they're going to get worse. So, you know, one time I wrote an essay, our state magazine assigned me an essay on, for Thanksgiving on grace and saying grace. And I interviewed professors at Duke and ministers and, it really is important to me to be thankful for thankful for moments like this where I'm able to have this conversation on a podcast, thankful for every assignment that I get, thankful for the fact that we, Laura and I have a wonderful backyard, 
with robins in the back, you know, and there, I don't know, there, it's just important to me to remember that because I think uh, it's so easy to get caught up in either the news of the day or where you're going that you can forget to just be grateful for being here right now. Michael, when you think about your childhood growing up on the Chesapeake Bay, your dad, a charter fisherman, how do those formative experiences of your childhood inform who you are and what you care about today? The things that my brother and I did were very simple pleasure type of things. You know, we would, we learned lessons by sticking our hand in a water or putting our foot on a tree limb or getting hit in the head with a baseball and, and bleeding um, a little bit. My brother broke broke more bones than I did, and that's something that I brag about to this day, you know. (laughs) But I think that they're just, I I guess that they inform me today because they're they're just very simple things that I loved. And and simple, and and they, they come across as especially simple today in a world where we have so many messages going on around us that we're being manipulated uh, by advertisers and politicians and things like that. But there's something just very simple and real about the fish got on the line because the fish was looking to eat. The crab's trying to pinch you because the crab doesn't want you to put it in the pot. I'm not a real country boy or anything like that. I don't ever think of myself like that. We still were only 45 minutes from the heart of the nation's capital. So I, I like to think of where I grew up as a place that was always in between. It was in Maryland, which is a very in between place. And where I grew up was, we were in the woods and we had water around, but we were, we took field trips to the, to the Smithsonian. I, I had my, my kindergarten class was 14 white, white kids and 13 black kids. We were sort of always a mix of things. And I, and so I, carry that I think today where I appreciate mixes of things and I appreciate the ability to go to the Kennedy Center one night and the and and then wake up the next day and figure out how to go hunting in the woods you know I there there's it's funny it's funny that you ask this because I try to keep simple things simple and I try to um to try to really understand, I spend a lot of time trying to understand complicated things. So I do, you, you mentioned off, off, off the microphone that I, you know, I drive a truck. I do. It's a 2007 Ford F-150. It's not because I'm a country boy. It's not because I'm anything like that. I, I bought it on my 27th birthday, brand new, 20 miles on it or whatever. It has crank windows. It has manual locks. When I would pull up to sporting events, I would have to lean over to the passenger seat to tell the, the ticket taker, uh, to roll down the window to tell the ticket taker why I'm there. And they sort of like look at me like, why can't you just press a button to do that? Well, I keep that simple because whenever I've gone to get that truck fixed, the fixes are very inexpensive. <laughs> and sometimes I can even do them. They're still sort of, it's still sort of just an old time truck, you know? And like I said, that that that's one that's just one way where I try to keep things simple that don't have to be complicated. I think I, I think, and that that maybe is is partially informed by the way I grew up. As a reader of your work, one theme or yearning I see in your writing is a seeking for a purity of experience. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Is that a fair reading? Yeah, yeah, it is. We've all gone through things in life. I went through, uh, I went through a divorce. Uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, we got married young uh, in our mid twenties, and we realized after we got married that we maybe didn't have personalities that, that matched. And going through the divorce process is hard. You're learning how, learning what to share with that person that you were supposedly sharing your life with and then pulling away. And, and there are parts of it where you're not necessarily, you just, you don't even know how you, you don't even know if you're being honest with yourself a lot of times and coming out of that I think gave me an appreciation for things I wanted. And yes, purity of experiences is, is one of them. I don't want to live dishonestly. Laura knows everything about me. My wife knows, uh, and, and there's nothing, there's no secret. 
in our um, relationship. And there's, that's, that's the most freeing thing that I've ever encountered in my life. And I guess that's part of, part of why I'm a journalist too. Um, my family jokes, my mom will at various points, um, when I'm over visiting them, my mom will say, you can't write about that because I've grown into writing essays and I sort of honestly tell stories about our family. <laughs> and I think it's gotten to the point where some people maybe don't say things around me where, <laughs> because they know that I don't, I don't, I just don't mind sharing. And to me, that's part of the, the purity, right? As long as I'm being honest in my work and in my home, I feel better. I've learned that that's one of the the essential ingredients of life. Michael, there is a long tradition of Southern storytellers. Mm -hmm. We have a great one here in Charlotte and Tommy Tomlinson. Would you like your name on the list? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Yeah, it's... um, I... You know, I, but not in a competition sense. Like I would never want, Tommy's a friend of mine and to me, he's the best there is. And to be associated with him or even included in a, in a list with him is thrilling because I know what his stories mean to me. So then if I'm able to give that experience to somebody else, then, then yes, that is, something that would would mean a lot to me but i don't think i'm anywhere close yet i don't i don't think i think there's you know, a, a lot of writing to be done i think writing is changing so quickly now i th- media is changing so much how people consume it changes so much there are great writers who've never written a story for a magazine nowadays you know there's uh, <laughs> i would love to Oh, gosh, I would love to give a more confident answer to that question. I there, I yes, two years ago I guess it was two years ago that the best American essays comes out, and Tommy has an essay in there, and I have an essay in there, and yes, that's that's I love that. You know, I, it's nice to it's just a nice nice to be associated with people that I know are doing great work, and um, maybe that means that I'm doing some great work too. Michael, when you think about your life and work, what is the story you want told about you? <laughs> I, I would hope that it was, um, that it answers the question that I talked about earlier. I hope it answers the, the big question, what, what did he do with this life? And one of the things that Laura and I bonded over was music. And our first uh, trip together was a mere few weeks after we started dating. We flew to Austin, Texas, and we saw uh, Jason Isbell and Shovels and Rope, um, two Americana singers, perform at, at the Moody Theater in Austin, Texas. And Jason Isbell has a song out now called If We Were Vampires. It's essentially a look ahead, a husband and wife looking ahead into the future and saying, one of us is going to outlive the other. So what do we want to do with the time that we have together? So I, I, you know, top of the list, I hope that he loved Laura and, um, and she loved him too. That would be nice. (laughs) No, but, uh, but I, I hope that he loved Laura is one of the first things that comes through. Um, and he cared deeply about family and friends and, community and things like that but they would sort of all spin off of what happens in the house where i live with her i guess wherever that may be thank you for your time today michael thank you mark thank that was that was fun michael graff is a freelance writer and editor he earned a bachelor's degree in english from high point university And now, a personal word. In a class I teach called The Good Life, we spend the first week of class talking about death. We don't talk about it for very long. The mood in the room gets complicated. There is fascination, moments of grief, feelings of dread, 
sadness, and despair. The conversation tests the meaning of our lives. What's the point of anything if we are going to die? So we come up with ways not to die. We believe we will live forever in heaven. We fall in love. We create artifacts that will outlast us. It's our only way to get on with it. The label we give it all is the human condition. We soon move on to other topics in the course. We discuss happiness, venturing, ways of knowing, relationships, material success. We grasp at insights. We piece things together. We make plans. The question driving the course is, what to do with this life? It's the same question that informs Michael Graff's work. To read his columns and essays and articles is to consider reasons that keep us soldiering on. He writes about the loss of medical care in rural communities, racing muscle cars along the highways, skydiving 20,000 times, a basketball player who made a famous shot who later committed suicide, eating crab cakes with his brother on the Chesapeake Bay, finding his way in the wilderness. In all his works, there is a reporting of facts, a beginning, middle, and end to a story that takes the reader on a journey. But there is something more in his work, a search for lost time, a remembrance of things past, moments of involuntary memory that lead to fragments of recollection. These are themes familiar to readers of Marcel Proust, who famously wrote of the memories that flooded him when he dipped a madeleine biscuit in his tea. I don't know if Michael has Marcel Proust in mind when he writes. I do think Michael explores memory in his writing because all remembrances are stories that begin and end, as do our lives, as does every love. When all of life is fleeting, when all that once exists fades away, Michael seeks to slow time down, to express eternity now, to give voice to what we have before it's gone. We hear it in his love for his wife, Laura, heart-stopping in its devotion, heartbreaking that it will end. And this is where Jason Isbell, singer-songwriter from Alabama, comes in. Jason sings about the same thing Michael Graff writes about, salvaging meaning from loss, downfall and redemption, the fragility and tenderness of life. Michael mentioned Jason's song, If We Were Vampires. Here are a few lyrics from the song. It's not the long flowing dress that you're in, or the light coming off your skin, the fragile heart you protected for so long, or the mercy in your sense of right and wrong. It's not your hands searching slow in the dark, or your nails leaving love's watermark. It's not the way you talk me off the roof, your questions like directions to the truth. It's knowing that this can't go on forever, Likely one of us will have to spend some days alone. Maybe we'll get 40 years together, but one day I'll be gone, or one day you'll be gone. If we were vampires and death was a joke, we'd go out on the sidewalk and smoke, and laugh at all the lovers and their plans. I wouldn't feel the need to hold your hand. Maybe time running out is a gift. I'll work hard till the end of my shift. I'll give you every second I can find, and hope it isn't me who's left behind. In a profile on Jason Isbell on CBS Sunday Morning, reporter Anthony Mason explores the love Jason has for his wife Amanda Shires. Mason says this about Jason Isbell, he might be a solo act, but he is not alone. That's how I think of the love Michael Graff has for his wife Laura and his work as a writer exploring what to do with this life. He might be a solo act, but he is not alone. That is the story that Michael is telling. We get on with it by loving the people we are with and the moment we are in. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners, 
and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.